online services at Calvary Baptist Church in Grayley, Michigan. I want to welcome you uh, and thank you for joining us today. This morning, uh, it is a little bit more like summer. Last week was Mother's Day, and it was like winter outside. We had snow on the ground for several days, or it snowed several days, and for this, this week and uh, this morning, uh, it's a, a nice Nice day, we've got warm weather coming, and so welcome to summer. I don't want to jinx it or anything, but welcome uh, to summer. Hopefully it sticks around this time. Once again, thank you for being with us. We're going to begin our service uh, today uh, with a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us. But God, we're thankful for the beauty of the weather, uh, the great week that you've given to us. God, I pray that now as we worship you in song, uh, as we're challenged from your word, God, that you would do a work in our heart. God, may you be honored and glorified in everything that we say, uh, every song that we sing during this service now. God, I do pray for those uh, of our church family. We long to be together, and we look forward to the day in which we can worship you uh, together once more. But until then, God, I pray that you bless our services uh, online through Facebook and YouTube. And God, may you begin all the honor and all the glory in all that we say and all that we do. God, we love you now. In Jesus' name, amen. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have lied in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart.
Happiness.
aren't you thankful for that powerful truth that there is power in the blood? I'm so thankful that Jesus willingly gave of his life, sacrificed himself on the cross of Calvary, and shed his blood for your sin and for my sin. There truly is power in the blood. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Jude. Uh, the book of Jude, as we continue uh, to study through and look at uh, really the job description of the Christian, or we could say even the, the Christian's lifestyle. We're in Jude, uh, and there's only, uh, uh, there's no chapters, I guess, but if you want to get, get technical, I suppose there is one chapter uh, in the book of Jude, but we're going to look down at verse number 20. So Jude and, and verse number 20. The Bible tells us this. It says, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, and of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. I want us to look back up at verse number 21, uh, and I'll show you uh, our launching off point uh, this morning. Uh, verse number 21 says, keep, keep yourselves in the love of God. And then the last part of that verse Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. We're going to be looking at uh, this thought here today. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Let's bow our heads as we begin our message today and ask the Lord to help us out this morning. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again that we can look into your word. God, I'm thankful that you've given us all that we need to live a successful Christian life. And as we consider the, uh, what the lifestyle of the Christian should be today, I pray that we would be a people that are looking uh, for your mercy, uh, even unto eternal life. God, I pray now that you bless the preaching of, of your word. I pray that you use me and speak through me this morning. God, may we take the truths that we hear apply them to our lives, and God, may we live a life that is different, a life that is changed, and more equipped to serve you. Bless us now in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we're our launching off point, verse number 21 here, uh, looking for uh, the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Uh, to further explain what, uh, uh, what we mean here today, I want us to turn over maybe just a few pages in your Bible to the book of Titus, <clears throat> the book of Titus. Uh, and we're gonna look at Titus chapter number two uh, as we consider this idea, consider this thought of looking for the mercy of our Lord and Jesus Christ unto eternal life. In Titus chapter number two, uh, I want us to look down at verse number 11. Titus chapter two and verse number 11. Verse number 11 says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. As we consider looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, we find here in Titus uh, chapter number two, I think three different ways uh, in which we can be looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it begins with number one here, salvation begins with salvation. In verse number 11 here in, in Titus chapter 2, it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. And then, uh, as we've already read, look down at verse number 14 once again. It says, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us, 
from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. As we think about salvation and looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, uh, it begins with us, with the individual, uh, placing our faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. But I want you to notice this first of all. The sinner, that's you, that's me. The sinner is a slave to sin. As we consider salvation today, we must know, uh, and we are reaffirmed from Scripture, that the sinner is a slave to sin. A familiar verse that you all know, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. And so when, the, when, I, when I make the statement that the sinner is a slave to sin, that is each and every one of us. We're all sinners. The question today is, are you a sinner saved by grace? Or are you a sinner doomed to spend an eternity separated from God? Uh, if you have a bookmark, I would encourage you to put that right here in Titus chapter 2. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. Or if you have, uh, or put a finger in there, don't take it off. But you can set your finger in there, I guess. But uh, let's uh, turn with me over to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Keep your spot there in Titus chapter 2. In Romans chapter 3, we find this, uh, uh, this truth here, this fact uh, that the sinner is a slave to sin. Romans chapter 3, if you would look down with me at verse number 9. Verse number 9 says, What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved both the Jew and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Uh, that speaks everybody is under sin. Verse number 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Once again, uh, in, the next, in that next verse there, we find that there is none righteous, no, not one. Verse number 11, there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. Or verse number 12, they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. The Bible is pretty clear. There is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned. In fact, down in verse number 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you would, look with me over at, uh, or down in verse number 20. Verse number 20 says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. We are not saved by our good works. We are not saved because we follow the, the Old Testament law. Uh, we are uh, not saved by all those things and how we live this life. And, uh, and uh, I applaud those who, who want to live a, a righteous life. But uh, that is not a way to salvation. That is not a way to Jesus Christ. The law is there to prove to us and show to us the fact that we need a Savior. You think about... Think about this in our country today. We've got uh, many laws in our country today. You might agree with them, you might not. But uh, if you were to get on the freeway here in northern Michigan uh, and get on uh, uh, I-75 and you were to travel either north or south, you would find that the speed limit is 75 miles per hour. But do you know what the average mile per hour is that, that most of us travel? We, we try to push it a little bit and we travel 79 miles an hour. Not quite 80, we're still in the 70s, close enough to 75 so that we won't get pulled over. Just because we can go 79 miles an hour doesn't make it right. The law tells us 75 miles an hour. That's what the law is. And, and that is the established guidelines for driving a vehicle on, uh, uh, on a I-75, and, uh, and the question is, uh, uh, just because the law is there, uh, are we following that law? The law shows us uh, where, uh, where we uh, make mistakes. It shows us the fact that we need a Savior. And if you're honest with yourself, uh, we've probably all gotten on roads and gone over the speed limit. We've broken the law. The law uh, is there to show us our need for a Savior. In fact, the Bible tells us uh, about the law that if we offend in one point, we are guilty of all. The sinner is a slave to sin. Turn over with me just a couple of chapters to chapter number six. 
in, in uh, Romans chapter number 6 and, and jump with me all the way down to verse number 16. Verse number 16 where the Bible says, uh, Know ye not that to whom ye yield your yield uh, to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, uh, his servants ye are to whom he obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, and I like that, that ye were the servants of sin. It says, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Mankind, we cannot help but serve sin. We cannot help but serve our flesh and follow after our lusts. But life doesn't have to be that way. We don't have to be a slave to sin. Verse number 17 tells us this, but God be thanked. Uh, praise the Lord for the fact that ye were the servants of sin. We were a slave to sin. But now, as we look at verse number 17, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, verse number 18, being then made free from sin, he became the servants of righteousness. The question today is, who are you serving? What are you serving? Are you serving sin or are you serving the Lord Jesus Christ? The sinner uh, is a slave to sin. And what is the result of that? Here in Romans chapter 6, you look at verse number 23, we find... The result of being a slave to sin. The Bible says for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because we are slaves to sin. Uh, the wages of our sin is death. That's our payment. That's what we deserve. But I like the last part of that verse. Where it tells us about the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Who are you serving today? Are you serving sin? Or are you serving Jesus Christ? To remain in our sin, to continue to serve sin, is dooming us to separation from God. Serving Jesus Christ by trusting Him as your personal Savior, uh, you are uh, welcomed into heaven for all of eternity. I want you to notice, secondly, as we consider salvation here, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ and salvation. Secondly, we see the Christian, the sinner saved by grace, has been redeemed. The Christian has been redeemed. We find out about the gift of salvation here in Romans chapter 6 and verse number 23, uh, but I want you to notice that the Christian has been redeemed. Follow me, if you will, over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, probably just a couple of pages away. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, and uh, as we consider the thought that the Christian has been redeemed, we have been bought, uh, our penalty has been paid, uh, the debt has been paid, we are bought with a price, uh, and we've been redeemed by the blood of Lamb, the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's why the song that was sung just a few moments ago, there is power in the blood. It is the power to save you from an eternity separated from God in hell. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 19 says this. It says what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. This is speaking to the sinner that has been saved by grace. And the question is posed here, what don't you know? Don't you know that uh, your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost? That's why it's, we must be, we'll talk about this in, in, in just a moment, so, so very careful with what we do with our bodies, where we go with our, uh, where we bring our bodies, all that. We've got to be very careful. Because we've been, we've been bought with a price, we find in verse number 20. Our body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, verse number 19. We do not belong to sin. We do not belong to our flesh, but rather we belong to God. Verse number 20 now. It says, for ye are bought with a price. We've been bought with a price. The price is this, is that blood had to be shed for our sin. And Jesus paid that price. For ye are bought with a price. And then look at the rest of verse number 20. 
Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. A sinner saved by grace. We no longer belong to sin. We no longer belong to this world. We no longer belong to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. But rather we belong to Jesus Christ because Jesus paid for us. He paid for us. It's like this. If you were to go to the store and to make a purchase of some sort. Um, it might be maybe a bag of chips, maybe a Mountain Dew. I'm a big fan of Mountain Dew, and I'm very protective of my Mountain Dew. But if you were to uh, uh, go to the store and buy something, that item it belongs to you. What do we hear? What do we hear kids say uh, more often than probably uh, any other word uh, when they're younger? They say one word, uh, and they're very adamant about this one word. It is a four-letter word. It is the word mine. Mine. That's mine. Give it back. That's mine. It's mine. It's mine. He took that from me. That's mine. That's mine. I hear that at my house from time to time. And that's just my wife. No, I'm just kidding. That's the kids. It's mine. That's, it's mine. Give it back. It's mine. Why is it that young children behave that way? Because that possession, that toy, whatever it might be, it belongs to them. And when it's not being used for their glory, their satisfaction, it disturbs them and they want it. That's the way the Lord is. Because we belong to Jesus Christ, we are to bring Him glory. We're to bring Him satisfaction with how we live the Christian life. Look what it says here in verse 20. It says, therefore, glorify God in your body. Why? Because we've been bought with a price. We belong to him. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You know, one of the uh, purposes of baptism is to bring glory to, to the Lord, to, to testify of your salvation uh, and, uh, and to identify with Jesus Christ, and that brings glory to God. Uh, and that is our goal as Christians. It begins uh, at salvation, and every moment thereafter, are we glorifying God with how we are living? That brings us to number two this morning. As we think about looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, it uh, begins at salvation, and then we follow it to the next step, and that is a separation. Separation. We read about this separation here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. Because we've been bought with a price, hey, we're to glorify God in our body. In verse number uh, 19 here, it tells us we're the temple of the Holy Ghost. Uh, we're not our own, but rather we belong to Christ. So we should live differently. We are to be separate. As we consider this, I want you to follow me back to Titus chapter number 2. Titus chapter number 2. We found here in Titus 2 and verse number 11, we, we will find that for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. We find in verse number 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us. He, he bought us from all the iniquity. And then it says in verse number 14, and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. But I want you to notice verse number 12 as we consider this idea of separation. Verse number 12 says, <coughs> teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Because we our, are Christians, because we are sinners saved by grace, but we must live a life that is separated unto God. And in verse number 12, uh, uh, it, it doesn't happen overnight here. We see in, uh, in verse number 12, it says, teaching us that. Teaching uh, uh, takes time. Uh, learning it takes time. Uh, and, it, and it happens moment by moment, day by day, uh, week by week. Wouldn't it be neat? 
uh, if, uh, and, and I think of my kids, and we go to school, and, uh, and the kids have gone to school, and, and if you went to school, that's great. You were there for, for 12 years, 13 including kindergarten, uh, 14, 15, for those of us who, who may have struggled a little bit. Uh, and then uh, we go off to college to learn a little bit more. We go to a trade school to learn a little bit more. Uh, it takes time to learn to grow. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just sort of download what we want to learn and be done with it? God, boom, I got it. I learned it. No problem. Aaliyah has played a song in the last several weeks, uh, uh, almost every service here, and she practices the whole week and gets ready for, for the one song. And she would love it if she could just uh, uh, program herself, boom, push the button. Oh, I know that song. Boom, I know it. I got it. No, it takes time to practice to learn. And so as we think about uh, this idea of separation and, and looking unto, uh, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, uh, in this separation aspect, it's important to note that, first of all, Christians, uh, we belong to God. The Christian belongs to God. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 7 and verse number 23, the Bible tells us, uh, here bought with a price, be not he the servants of Men, because we've been bought with a price, uh, we are not to serve men. We are to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Second Corinthians chapter six and verse seventeen and eighteen uh, says this: Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Because uh, we are Christians, because we have been saved by grace, we belong to God, and we should live a separate, holy. The Bible says, wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. We are not to be touched by the world. We are to live separate from the world. And that goes into every aspect and every area of our life. Our speech, our thoughts, our actions, the places that we go, the things that we see and listen to, are they separated unto God? The Christian belongs to God. We're not to serve men, but also, as we consider separation here, the Christian believes God. The Christian believes God. You're sitting there saying, well, duh, thanks, Pastor, for that thought. That's pretty obvious. The Christian believes God. Yes, it is pretty obvious. In regards to salvation, we must believe God. We must believe in Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. But what saddens me is that, uh, that the, the average Christian, we, we profess our, our faith and trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, uh, but, but we, we fail to trust Jesus Christ uh, for each and every day, for the moment of each day, for, for, for next week, next month, next year. We say for salvation, uh, Jesus is adequate, but for today, we often fail to believe. In Romans chapter 6 and verse number 13, the Bible says, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members are instruments of righteousness unto God. We're to yield yourselves to God. That takes faith. That takes belief. To think about the, uh, every time when we open up this book here for, uh, for maybe our daily devotions or some Bible reading. Uh, or we come to a church service or, or watch a service online or, or, or come to our, our children's ministry, The Rock. Or come to Sunday school or come to a, a revival service or a missions conference or, or whatever it might be. When we, we go anywhere to hear the word of God preached, we're to yield ourselves to God. That takes belief. That takes faith to yield yourself, your will to God. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane prayed, uh, uh, not my will, but thine be done. That takes belief. We trust Jesus for our eternity. And I, I don't want to go to hell when I die. I want to go to heaven. We place our faith and trust in Jesus for eternity. But we fail to do it for today. And the Lord may, may work in our heart to, during a time of devotion, during a, a service. How many times have we sat there and we've done nothing with what God has said? 
Say, God, surely you can't be speaking to me. The Christian believes God. You might have said, well, duh. Well, how come we don't do it on a daily basis with our daily lives? God has promised to never leave us nor forsake us. God wants us to have the, the abundant life, to live the abundant life. Will you yield yourselves to him? Casting off that old man, the flesh, the sin, the world. No longer serving sin, but serving God. Thirdly, here this morning, as we think about looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, it's found in salvation. It's found a, a, as we grow in our walk with Jesus Christ through separation, but also looking has the idea of, and it's very simple, number three here, sight. Sight. We're looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. It involves sight. It involves actually uh, looking, and it reminds me of the, uh, of the verse where it tells us, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Are we seeking uh, the Lord Jesus Christ? We find this theme all throughout Scripture where we're to search the Scriptures uh, and uh, we're to study uh, things out. Uh, Psalms tells us, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Sight is used oftentimes in Scripture. It's a picture for the believer. And it, and it brings great hope for the believer. I want you to notice as we consider sight here this morning. Follow me over to Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12. What do we need to be looking for? What do we need this sight for? We need it, first of all, for living the Christian life. Why do we need to be looking uh, for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ unto salvation? We need it to live a successful Christian life. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 1 says this, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Just a moment ago, we challenged you, I challenged you to, to yield yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. But Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 2 tells us that we're to be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. If we're not looking unto Jesus through Scripture, if we're not looking unto Jesus uh, uh, through faithfulness to the, to the Lord's house when we're opened back up and uh, being challenged with Scripture, we will not be able, if, we, if we're not faithful to doing either one of those things, then how can we yield ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ? If we aren't under the preaching of the Word of God, and if the Holy Spirit does not have freedom to move in our life, we cannot see where the Lord would direct. We're to be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You know, that idea of looking, it, it, it's happening present day. He's the author and finisher of our faith. Our salvation rests in Him. Does your day rest in Him? Does next week rest in Him? Living the Christian life it involves the sight, it involves the looking. But lastly, here as we consider sight as well, there is a longing to see Jesus. There is a longing to see Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 28, the Bible tells us, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto Salvation. Do you have a longing to see Jesus? Back in Titus chapter number 2 and verse number 13, the Bible tells us, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you long to see Jesus? 
for some, this longing to see Jesus has, uh, grown, has grown more intense because we have loved ones that have gone before. And heaven has grown uh, sweeter, and, and we long to, to reunite with those loved ones. And, it's, and that's all possible because of Jesus Christ. Uh, in Titus here, we see that we're to be looking for that blessed hope, the, the return of Jesus Christ uh, happening at the, uh, the rapture as he returns and takes us back uh, to heaven to be with him for all of eternity. And then we have the second coming of Jesus Christ when he comes back to this earth and he rules on this earth for a thousand years. Are we looking and longing for Jesus' return? I remember as a, as a teenager said, uh, thinking, man, I, I hope the Lord doesn't come back today. I'd like to grow up. I'd like to be an adult. I'd like to experience life a little bit. And, uh, and I find that the, the older I get, uh, the more I want to be with Jesus. There's a longing there. I think of gentlemen in our church, Bud Corley. Every, every moment of every day, he's in pain. He's going to be 91 this summer, and he's longing to see Jesus. And he, and he questions, he says, I don't know why the Lord has me here. I, I'd rather be there with him. Why am I, I down here suffering? I'd rather be with the Lord. And, and what, a, uh, what a great testimony that is, that he longs to be with Jesus. His faith will soon become sight. I remember when I was dating my wife. I remember that in between dates and in between times when we'd see each other, there was a longing to, to be with her. There was a longing to see her. There was a, a longing to talk with her. We met in college, and her family lives in Florida, and, and I live in Michigan, and so there's uh, many miles between us. And uh, during those uh, those breaks from school, there was uh, there were uh, it was difficult because we longed to be together. We longed to see each other. Do we have that same longing for Jesus Christ? As a Christian, this world is not our home. We're just passing. Our home is in heaven. In John chapter 14, we find in verses 2 and 3, where Jesus says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And then he tells us, he says, uh, he's coming again. Where will you be for eternity? Christian, your eternity is sealed. You've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You cannot lose that salvation. And you will be with the Lord Jesus Christ for all of eternity. If you've never trusted Christ as your, as your Savior, your eternity is not set. Right now, you're on a path to destruction. You're on a path to separation from God. But this morning... If you believe with all of your heart that Jesus died for you, you can trust Jesus Christ as your Savior this morning, and your destiny can be switched from hell and separation from God to heaven, eternity with God. The choice is yours. As we think about our challenge for this morning, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ into eternal life. If you're watching this video, there's never been a time that you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I encourage you right where you're at. When this video is, uh, is over, you may want to pause it right now. You may want to pray. And just ask the Lord to save you from your sin. It might be a prayer that's similar to this, if you believe with all of your heart. I pray a prayer similar, similar to this. I said, simply, dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that I need a Savior. I'm trusting you now, Jesus, with all, with all of my heart to save me from my sin and to take me to heaven someday to be with you for all of eternity. The best that I know how I'm trusting you now as my personal Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. It's a prayer very similar to that that I prayed. The words might be different that, that maybe you use, but you must believe it with all of your heart. Will you do that today? If you're watching and you are, uh, are praying and asking Jesus to save you from your sin, 
that's a decision that you're going to make. I'd love to hear about that. You can comment in the, uh, below on the, on the video, and, uh, and that would be a great encouragement and blessing to me, and there would be many people rejoicing over that. But Christian today, if you're watching, you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. Let's live a life that is separate from the world. Let's be the testimony that God would have us to be. Uh, just a moment ago, I encouraged uh, uh, the unsaved sinners to, uh, to pray and ask Jesus uh, to be their Savior by grace through faith, trusting in Jesus Christ. Well, are you trusting Jesus Christ for each and every day? Are you trusting him as you read the word and maybe the Holy Spirit works in, in your heart and, and the Holy Spirit would ask you to, to get rid of that sin in your life, to turn from, uh, from maybe that, uh, that, that wickedness and, and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ? Would you commit to living a separate life? And then, Christian, let's live like Jesus is coming back. Do you have a longing to be with Jesus? Man, that's exciting to know that Jesus could come back today. Are you ready for him? Are you serving him today? As we think about Jude, are we looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life? Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can look into your word today. Thankful for your mercy. I'm thankful that, that you saved me. And that God, you lead me each and every day. The challenge is for me to yield to you, to yield to your will, and live a life that is honoring and glorifying to me. God, help me. Help your people to live you're coming back today. And then, God, I pray for the individual that may not know you as their personal Savior. I pray that today they come to trust you. And God, they see their eternal destination changed. God, I'm thankful we can look into your word this morning. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to Thank you, first of all, for joining us for our service today. Uh, thank you for being a part of it. I want to encourage you along a couple of lines. Be sure, first of all, if you can, uh, like and share uh, this video. Some may watch this uh, uh, throughout the day. And so like and share it on Facebook. Maybe send, it, uh, send a link uh, through text messaging. You can uh, do that uh, uh, from your YouTube, and you can send a link to somebody uh, through, through Messenger on Facebook or through your text message. Uh, uh, as well. And then also I want to encourage you on a couple lines. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. Many of you uh, have remained faithful in giving to the church. Thank you so much for your faithfulness in giving. The Lord will bless you for that. And the Lord has met all of our needs here at the church. He continues to do so. And I want to thank you so much uh, for your faithfulness in giving. Also, I uh, want to encourage you to uh, be in prayer. Uh, we're uh, kind of doing some renovating here at the church and uh, cleaning up some, some rooms and painting rooms, and uh, we've got a bathroom remodel going on, on right now, so I want to ask you to pray for our men as they work, and uh, ladies as they clean a little bit, and so thank you so much to all those who have been a part of that. Uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you would, continue to pray for that. Looking forward to when we can get back uh, together very soon. Uh, right now, uh, we are planning on, tentatively planning on opening up uh, for our our first Sunday service back uh, Sunday, May 31st. And so I want, to, I want you to pray with me about that. And uh, we look forward to getting back together very soon. And we're planning on May 31st. The uh, stay-at-home order is in effect until the 28th uh, from our governor. Uh, and so we want to open up on May 31st. What we're going to do is we will have uh, just the morning service uh, on May 31st. It'll be at 1030. We'll have just that service uh, uh, for the day, uh, and then we'll pick up our regular schedule on the, on that Wednesday at six o'clock, and then the following Sunday we'll pick up Sunday school and all of that. And so uh, our our first service is going to be May thirty first. So we'll have more information about that uh, next Sunday about what you can expect uh, for that service. But I'm excited 
about being able to get back together. I'm excited, excited to be able to see you, worship with you, fellowship with you, uh, and enjoy serving our Lord uh, together. Uh, thank you once again for being with us, being prayer for us here at the church. I pray for you. I love you all. I miss you all so very much and can't wait to see you again. Once again, thank you so much for being with us today. Have a blessed Sunday and look forward to our next time together.